everyone for joining us. I uh, want to make sure that you are in the right meeting. It's Solar Options with the um, Topsum Energy Committee. Um, and just wanted to thank you for being here. I'm Yvette Meunier, I'm the chair of um, the Topsum Energy Committee. And joining me is uh, another Topsumite, my neighbor, Tim Glidden. He is um, going to be joining us. He has worked in conservation and environmental issues here in Maine full time since 1983. Um, he will be moderating our session. We also have Vice Chair Nick Watley. Uh, he is with us as well. And um, committee member Victor Langelo, who will also join us, who can speak to their experiences with the services we'll be hearing about tonight. Just a little background before we get going. Um, Topsom's Energy Committee started in October of 2020. We research and recommend strategies, policies, and projects to the select board that will achieve energy conservation and thus reduce Topsom's um, greenhouse gas emissions and energy costs. We also offer public information sessions like tonight, education outreach on energy conservation, renewable energy um, on our website as well. Um, and I have in the chat put what our website is um, and we'll put more resources in there. Um, we also um, help uh, deploy energy conservation practices with our residents, schools and businesses to align with the goals and strategies of the Maine um, Climate Council and we meet publicly on Zoom. It is the fourth Tuesday of the month at 4.30 p.m. Um, so feel free to join us and check out some more information on our webpage. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Tim. <clears throat> Thanks, Yvette. Um, as uh, Yvette said, I'm Tim Glidden. Um, I apologize in advance. I'm, this is the advantage of Zoom. I'm fighting off a little cold. It is, I've tested twice negative, so I know I've not got the dreaded virus, um, but I have another dreaded virus, apparently. So with you tonight, if I sneeze a little bit, <clears throat> I apologize. And just a couple of housekeeping um, measures. I think we're all Zoom pros now, and we're in a webinar setting. So, um, but if for some reason um, you, uh, you know, find yourself uh, feeding audio into the, into the uh, Zoom, please mute yourself. Um, we will be taking questions at the end, but as questions occur to you all through the three presenters, please feel free to put those into the Q&A um, function and we will track them and I'll try to get to all of them or as many as we possibly can at the end. And that's also a way for us to be sharing resources back and forth. Um, as um, I think was said earlier, um, we are recording this. The recording is going to be made available on the committee's website, along with a bunch of other resources. And if you do have any technical difficulties, I know we had a little bit um, um, early on here, please feel free to shoot a question to us and somebody will attempt to um, troubleshoot the problem you have if, if it's a Zoom setting kind of thing. So we've got three panelists with us tonight, uh, Kaylin Perkins, Kay Mann, and Stephanie Spaulding. We're gonna take each in turn. Kaylin is going to be up first. Kaylin um, <clears throat> spent a little time uh, on, the, on the left coast, which we will forgive him for, but he's, but he's back up here in New England and in Maine. Um, he worked out in San Francisco with a local boys and girls club, um, helping them become greener. And he's now working at Revision, and he enjoys helping Mainers find ways to lighten their impact on the environment. He's in a house in Portland with 29 solar panels and three heat pumps. I've got four, Caleb, but I have no panels. So I'll talk to you later about that. And they help him keep him comfortable and his carbon um, impact low, along with costs. And he's got a real passion for doing the work here that solves climate, we hope, um, and um, he's also quite passionate about his music. And we've got a couple of musicians, I think, um, and the panelists tonight, but he plays with a folk rock group here in the Portland area. So Kaylin, um, tell us, what's up? Hi, Tim. Hi, everybody. Um, really glad to be here with you all on this rainy evening, talking about uh, solar, one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, I think there's a, there's an overlap between musicians and the solar industry for some reason. I find a lot of them here at Revision too. 
Um, so I'm going to give just a quick sort of brief and basic um, presentation, not too long and complicated, um, just sort of introducing you a little bit to who we are at Revision Energy um, and sort of our perspective on the problems that we're trying to solve and some ways that we think about doing that, um, including community solar as one of the, one of the options. Um, so I'm just going to get into sharing my screen here in a moment. <clears throat> All right. There we go. So um, just a quick background on Revision Energy. Um, we've been in business about 20 years in Maine and have grown quite a bit over those years. Um, originally started as a solar company primarily. And we've grown now to over 350 um, throughout five different branches that we have, two of which are in Maine, two in New Hampshire, and one in Massachusetts uh, at this point. We are 100% employee owned, which is one of the kind of cool features of our company. So everybody that works here is a part owner of the business. Um, and as someone that works for the company, I feel like that makes a pretty big difference to me and to the culture here and I think for the public. It's nice to know that anyone you talk to or interact with um, at Revision is an owner of the company. I think that does make a difference. We're also a certified B Corp, um, which is a phrase you might have heard. Um, companies like Ben and Jerry's are sort of known for that um, certification as well. It's essentially a, a third party verification that businesses are promoting not just making a profit, but also doing um, the right thing for the people that work there and for the, the communities that they work in. So we're really proud of that. Um, we've got a mission basically to help transition New England off of fossil fuels. Um, and so as, uh, as I mentioned, we started as a solar company primarily, but over the years we've found it made sense to branch out and offer a lot of other things as well to give people more tools to make that transition um, in their homes and businesses. So, you know, we're a company of engineers and plumbers and electricians and, um, and creative people. And so we've added things like heat pumps, um, which are obviously really popular, heat pump water heaters, batteries for backup power and power outages, and also electric car chargers um, as people are transitioning their cars from gasoline to electric. Um, so we think it's important to provide all of those different solutions and help people um, change not just their electric bill, but also their oil or propane bill and their gasoline bill as well. So you've probably heard the phrase elect electrify everything, um, which we basically believe is kind of the way that we solve climate change. We have to provide our energy cleanly. Um, and for that to have the biggest impact, we need to be using things that can be powered by that clean electricity. Um, we can't make propane or oil or gas on our rooftops um, or from the sunshine that falls on panels in a sunny field. But we can make electricity and there's a lot that we can do with that electricity. Um, this slide here sort of shows our vision of the, the solar home. Um, this would be with panels on the rooftop, which is certainly something we offer and, and promote quite a bit. Um, a home heated by heat pumps, heat pump water heater for the domestic hot water, batteries in the basement or garage for power outages, and an EV in the driveway um, running on clean solar electricity. So um, we do plenty of rooftop solar for both homes and businesses, and we've also been in the solar farm game for quite a while now as well. Um, Luckily, we're at a point in state policy here in Maine where solar farms can be much bigger than they used to be. We were um, kind of early into the market of solar farms, you know, five or 10 years ago when we were restricted by policy to build them no larger than nine participants in size at a time. Um, and luckily, a couple of years ago, with some new legislation that has changed and we can build much larger scale farms now. Um, the ones we're doing on average would be maybe 100 to 200 um, members per farm would be sort of a typical size. Um, this is one that went live last year um, in the town of Knox, Maine, serving uh, CMP customers here in Southern Maine. So the green 
highlighted portion is just an example of you know maybe what one person's portion of that system would look like. Um, and one of the things you know we'll be talking about today is different kinds of solar farms. We currently are offering what's called the ownership model of solar farms, where um, a customer would actually buy into, um, as an owner, uh, a portion of that solar farm. Um, we'll also be talking a little bit about subscription solar farms, which would be sort of a different model um, where you're just signing up and sort of getting a discount on your electric bill. So community solar um, really is a, a critical part of the picture here in terms of getting our our energy cleanly from sunshine. We like it because it's really inclusive. Um, it can apply to people who maybe don't own the building that they live in. They might be a renter. Uh, maybe they're in a condo where shared ownership of a roof kind of makes that tricky. Um, they might have uh, shade on the rooftop, so it's not an optimal location for solar panels. Um, they might have already filled up the good part of the roof. And actually at this point, in our you know, history as a company, a lot of the people that are coming to us for solar farms are previous rooftop solar customers who have continued to transition their lives from fossil fuels to electricity and need more production from their solar system uh, than what their er earlier system could produce. So one of the nice things we can do is actually blend um, both of those two sources together to offset your bill. So I just described this a little bit, the two, two types um, of community solar farms, both subscription and ownership. Um, both are important. Um, Revision will probably do both um, at some point. Um, right now we're primarily doing the ownership version, so I can certainly talk about that today, um, where the federal tax credit applies to investors in that system, and you basically generate you know, uh, the most savings over time that you could because you own all of the output um, of that portion of the system. So it's gonna pay itself back. And after a certain point, um, you'll just sort of be making free power from then on. This is an example of different costs um, from left to right. This is sort of doing business as usual on the left column, just purchasing electricity from the utility company and that's at today's rates. Um, the next bar over would be doing a subscription solar farm, just as an example model of, uh, of a 10% discount. 10%, um, 15% are pretty common ones that we see. Um, the next column over um, would be if the utility company didn't raise their rates at all, which is unlikely. Um, and then the fourth column, the green one, would be if you took a loan out to fund an investment in a revision energy solar farm. And then the final column would be if you paid cash for that investment. Um, what your overall costs would be. So a lot of people ask about, and we can certainly get into today, um, pros and cons of each choice, especially, you know, in my world as a residential solar designer, um, my job is to sit with people at their kitchen table and talk them through their energy transition. Um, I design heat pump systems, I design battery systems, rooftop solar systems, and also sell shares in community solar farms that we build. Um, so there's not you know, a super clear distinction between one is the right choice and one is the wrong choice. Um, if you have a sunny rooftop, it can be worth considering both options, um, a solar farm offsite or panels onsite on the home um, providing electricity. One of the benefits of putting them on your, putting them on your own property is that um, there's a pretty well demonstrated um, bump in resale value by doing that. Um, in the intro, it was mentioned that I have panels on my house. I actually bought that house with the panels already on it um, and saw in the appraisal that, that came back that um, they were including some, some extra value for those solar panels. Um, how much, you know, of course, depends on the market and the location and who's buying the house and who's selling the house, but 4% um, to 5% is sort of a common, um, uh, commonly quoted percentage um, that a solar home would sell for on top of a, a similar house that didn't have solar panels. Um, backup storage is another point in favor of panels on your own property. Um, if you have a battery system there that's powered by solar panels, it can qualify for the same federal tax credit that solar qualifies for, which is currently 26%. Um, and you're charging that battery with sunshine, which is nice. You're not um, you're not running the home on a fuel 
um, during a power outage, which is nice too. Batteries also allow solar panels to stay on and active during an outage when you have sunshine happening. Um, if you have panels on your roof, but no battery, they would shut down during an outage. Um, but the pairing of the two allows that system to be um, active and running during a power outage and producing uh, in real time more electricity for you. Here's an example of a battery system. Um, Tesla Powerwall has been a, a popular product that we've installed quite a lot of. Um, heat pumps, another thing that I mentioned we offer here. I'm sure most of you have at least heard of heat pumps at this point if, if you don't already have them in your homes. Um, we install lots and lots of these. It, they're really one of the critical technologies in making a clean energy transition. Um, it's the way that we produce heating and cooling efficiently and via electricity. And heat pump water heaters are another really great option too. Um, we install lots of these and they help people reduce their um, fossil fuel consumption. So wrapping up here, um, this is just a slide that I kind of like showing um, the potential capacity for different sources of energy. So on the left side, we have the annual um, global production of these different types of um, sources. I shouldn't say production, I should say potential resource. Um, and on the right side is the total remaining um, resource of these fossil fuel um, types. So everything that's out there that could be extracted and consumed is captured in those um, circles on the right. And these are obviously um, scaled relative to each other. And then solar's in the middle. Um, you know, lots and lots of sunshine falls on the planet every day. It's hard to capture it all. It's impossible to capture it all. And even the solar that you do capture, you're not actually getting 100% um, of the energy out of it. Um, some of it's wasted in reflection, heat, and so forth. But um, it's pretty cool that, you know, it dwarfs the rest of <laughs> those sources by quite a bit. Um, and I just like this slide. This is sort of a, a southern Maine focused um, map of some systems that uh, of the systems that we've installed as a company over our lifetime. Um, lots of experience all over northern New England. I'm going to stop it there to keep things short and sweet. Um, look forward to talking some more in the presentation and answering questions. Kaylin, thank you. Yes, just a reminder, do put questions in. I see we've got a couple um, in key questions in the Q&A and we'll get to them towards the end. Um, very interesting there. Thank you for that and sort of laying out that scope of um, the options, Kaylin. Um, next up is Kay, Kay Mann. Kay Mann is with Power Market and she's been the community outreach director for them since 2020. And she worked for seven years at the Maine Green Power Program as the outreach coordinator did a website, a newsletter, um, and has also been working. At, she has been a, if I got it right, a volunteer board member, or was a volunteer board member on the Hydrogen Energy Center as well. So, oh my gosh, there's there's a whole there'd be a whole Zoom call just on that topic alone. Um, so, Kay, um, what would you like? Oh, she's been on all sorts of other um, wonderful um, volunteer committees right here in the Brunswick area. Um, and she is our other musician in the panelists, as far as I know. Uh, mandolin player. If you're looking for somebody, Caitlin, on the mandolin there. Um, Kay, um, tell us what's new. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate the introduction. And Caitlin, don't get too excited because I play the mandolin kind of apologetically, old time style. And uh, my... Um, my jam group has sort of dissolved a little bit with partially due to COVID and partially due to my relocation. So I lived in 24 years in the Brunswick area. Last fall, we moved to Hollowell. So I'm in a new community. Don't know the musicians here yet. Stay tuned on that. Anyway, back to energy. I'm going to share my screen and I have a little bit of, um, I'm going to start off with kind of a little bit of personal background. Let me shrink this turn it into a viewable slideshow. Stop this. Okay. Community Solar for Maine. I'm going to be talking about the subscription model that Kaylin uh, mentioned a little bit. I'm going to start though by, let's see if I can shrink the people out a little bit there. 
So you can see the pictures. Um, this is just family shots. My husband and I are a second marriage, blended family. I am a uh, erstwhile street mime that you may have seen at the Brunswick Downtown Arts Festival um, many years running until COVID kind of put the stall on that. Also have dance background and part of the um, contra dance community, which is why we have so many musical friends who came and played for us at our wedding in the top right third picture over. And um, the middle picture is my mom and my daughter. My mom has since passed, but uh, she was in the real estate industry in um, Greater Brunswick for 20 or 30 years <laughs> until she retired in the late 90s. And my daughter, who's with her in that picture, is Julia. She is a hairstylist at Cook's Corner. And my husband in the lower right, Harold, used to own the Corsican Pizza during the 80s, if anybody remembers that, on Union Street. So a little bit of um, trip down memory lane. Also, um, Tim already mentioned some of my energy history. I got interested in renewable energy in the early 2000s. I joined the board of the Hydrogen Energy Center. And it turned out to be a way that I learned a whole lot about renewable energy in general, and in particular, how to store it using hydrogen. By converting energy to hydrogen, uh, it becomes a storage medium. Um, I was a member of the E2 Tech Council, which is a trade organization around the clean tech industry in Maine. It, E2 stands for Environmental and Energy Technology Council of Maine. It's a really long name, so they shorten it. It's a wonderful place to go to their events and learn things. And the Green Energy Maine is the website that I um, started up and operated for about eight years as a volunteer from 2011 to 2018. I put out newsletters about renewable energy for the state of Maine. And also during that time, I was the outreach coordinator for the Maine Green Power Program, which you're gonna hear a lot more about from Stephanie. So I wanna briefly touch on different ways that we can cut our electricity costs. Um, the first and most important one is to make energy efficiency improvements. In other words, use less power. That's the ultimate best thing any of us can do ever is just quit consuming so much electricity or any other form of energy. The second is um, you can shop around and uh, be a wise consumer, shop for a cheaper source of your energy supply. And these are both the non-solar solutions. The third is our favorite, which is to go solar. And there are three ways you can do that. So the first two I'm gonna kind of skip over, but later I'm gonna give you resources in the chat, which once I'm done talking, I'll, I'll put a list of resources into the chat for everybody with some websites you can go to and find out ways to do those two things. So why should we go solar? Well, First of all, it helps us as a state to meet our clean energy goals that the governor set out when she took office to get our state to 80% renewable energy by 2030 and 100% renewable energy by 2050. So we won't get there unless we start installing a lot more solar power and, and using a lot more solar power. Um, the important thing economically is that we're keeping our energy dollars circulating here in, in Maine's economy uh, for every, Let's see, for every dollar we spend on energy that is coming from fossil fuels, 80% of that, 80 cents of that is leaving our state's economy. Goodbye, gone. And if we could keep those 80 cents circulating in our state's economy, how much um, healthier and more sound would our economy be? The third is, of course, we want to become energy independent. We don't want to be dependent on those kinds of fuels that don't exist here in Maine under our ground. Maine has no fossil fuel resource, no sense um, paying money to people from away to bring that to us. So this way we can become more resilient and independent. So um, I'd like to describe the three ways we can go solar that Kaylin already has done, but I like to use an analogy in doing so. If you buy your own rooftop system, that's a great solution. It's kind of like buying a house. You're, you are paying for it up front. You might take a loan out to do it. I don't know, you're gonna get a tax credit. You have all the rights and responsibilities of ownership. The second way is to invest as an owner, investor, shareholder in a community solar farm. 
and that's the other way that revision offers it's kind of like buying a condo you're buying something you own it you have the rights and responsibilities of ownership including the tax break and you're making group decisions with other people who also own a little piece of what it is that you own and then the third way is if you subscribe along with other people to a community solar farm it's more like renting a condo or a house or any other place to live you don't get the rights and responsibilities of ownership you don't get the tax credit the developer gets that but you can also kind of come and go pretty easily without having to worry about selling your share or um, or selling a house that now has more value on it because there's solar panels on it. At any rate, um, those are kind of the three different models uh, for going solar. And it pretty much means anybody in Maine who wants to go solar now can do so unless you're one of those people, few remaining people for whom the landlord pays your electricity bill and controls your electricity account for the building you're in. Those are the only people today who don't have a solar option at all. So let's see, here we go. I have a video to play you. It's just a couple minutes long and I'm gonna share that now. Let's see, can solar I make it bigger? Local, the more affordable than ever, and thus more popular. In 2006, only 30,000 American homes had solar panels. Today, that number has grown to over 1 million. But what if you don't own your home, don't have an ideal roof, or simply don't want to deal with solar panels on your property? Fortunately, Community Solar makes the benefits of solar power available to everyone without requiring the rooftop installation or the maintenance and upkeep that comes with one. Instead, participants in a community solar program share the electricity generated by a large, single solar facility. Because solar power experiences economies of scale, the community solar facilities can cost as much as 50% less to build and maintain than the same number of solar panels installed on multiple rooftops. It's easy to get started with a community solar program. First, you'll need to decide how much solar power you'd like. You can offset part of your energy needs, or all of it. To offset its total energy consumption, the average U.S. house will need 20 to 25 panels. In electricity terms, this is the equivalent of 6 to 8 kilowatts of solar capacity. Then, each month, you pay a special community solar rate applicable to your share of the electricity generated by the solar facility that month. The community solar rate applies to only if you and your fellow program participants yes, you and may not increase over I'm your stay in the program, protecting you against the uncertainty of future electricity rate rises. If you use more electricity in any given month than what is produced by your share of the community solar facility, you pay your normal electric rate for the excess electricity consumption. So while every home may not be able to host a solar panel, every consumer can now benefit from solar power. Community solar programs are making it easier than ever to transition to a clean energy future. For research and insights on community solar, visit us today. Uh oh. Solar power is clean. Stop. Let me see if I can go past this. Solar power is clean. Oops. No. Escape. There we go. Now I feel better. Sorry, I have trouble sometimes making that thing stop. Let me go to the next one. So, quick uh, primer on how the solar credits work if you're subscribed to a solar farm. It really works the same as far as the crediting and the accounting for the solar credits go as if you had solar panels on your own roof. Only thing is you don't have to have them on your roof. Somebody else has built the thing uh, somewhere else. Uh, the solar farm just has, has to exist someplace else within the same utility service territory as where you live, which means in our case, CMP. And um, each of the subscribers gets a little percentage, like a slice of the pie of the power that comes out of their solar farm. And those uh, kilowatt hour credits are applied against your monthly light bills from CMP to reduce how many kilowatt hours CMP is gonna bill you for each month. So you'll still get a CMP bill, it'll just be greatly shrunken by your solar credits. In turn, you'll get an invoice from Power Market, if it's our company uh, or whoever you're subscribed with, you will get an invoice each month for the solar power that was applied 
uh, and generated for you and reduced your CMP bill that month. And they'll bill you at the going rate combined for delivery and supply minus a 15% discount, which stays the same. That discount doesn't go up or down. So the important distinction is that we're not applying a straight 15% discount off the bottom line of your CMP bill each month, but rather this 15% discount is applied against the bottom line of your power market solar bill each month. So um, the amounts of the credits go up and down every month with the solar production at different times of year. And of course, our usage changes month to month with different times of year that we use more and less. So um, it doesn't cost anything to sign up for Community Solar. And anytime you want to cancel your subscription, you can do so with about 60 days advance notice. Roughly that equates to two billing cycles. And that doesn't cost anything either. So. It's pretty low barrier to entry or exit. And let me see if I can. Good. Okay. And even finer print. <laughs> to get more granular, I like to tell everybody right up front before they subscribe to a community solar field that, first of all, they have to be comfortable with getting um, communications from the solar company back and forth <laughs> to them by uh, email. And so they have to have a working email account. And this is not the case for everybody in Maine. So I have to make sure people are comfortable with that, first of all. So the invoices and also before the solar field comes online, once you're subscribed and you're kind of in this holding pattern, waiting for it to start up, uh, you'll be getting monthly updates about the status of the project. And those all come by email. The second thing is that all the payments for your solar credits are made by an automated electronic debit system that the banking industry calls ACH. And I don't know what that stands for, but it comes out of a checking account. And you're always given seven to 10 days advance notice before your payment is taken from your checking account. So they'll send an email with an invoice attached saying, this is how much it'll be. And it's gonna be seven to 10 days later. That's when you'll uh, see the however much it is, you know, disappearing out of your bank account to pay that bill. And then there's this extra um, reporting document that is given to everybody subscribed to a community solar farm. And it's the same thing that people with rooftop solar get integrated right on their CMP bills. But thus far, up till now, CMP has not been able to integrate this thing they call a generation chart right onto the CMP bills for the people who are subscribers to Community Solar Farm. And so there's this funny little document that comes kind of cryptic looking, doesn't say CMP on the document anywhere, it has your name and your account number. The envelope it is sent to you in says CMP in the return address spot. But if you open your mail in a hurry and don't notice where it came from, you might be mystified the first time. At any rate, the generation chart is something CMP provides that shows you the status of how many solar credits were generated for you in a given month, how much power you used in that month, and any difference in those two numbers, which are almost never the same. If, um, if we have under generated solar power for you in that month, then CMP would, will be billing you for the balance. Or if we have over generated solar power for you in that month, the uh, solar credits that are extra or left over will be banked. They literally call it a bank, stored up to your credit and rolled forward to be applied to your account in those months with the shorter days when your usage might exceed the amount of power that's gener generated for you. So that's the same way it works for people with solar on the roof. And it's just the, the main difference is that the physical panels are someplace far away. Mine are in Belfast, for example. Live in Hallowell, solar field in Belfast. It's all good. So here's just a picture of one of our solar farms. This is one of the first ones that started up. It was um, built in Baldwin on the site of a former granite quarry. So it's regarded as kind of a brownfield type site where it was repurposed. Um, we can't say that for all of our projects. Some of them do involve cutting trees or at least cutting trees to expand a, a site. So that's a concern some people have. Um, but we work um, as much as possible. We give preference to brownfield type sites where 
um, land is not being taken out of either forest or farming use. So that's the one in Baldwin. Went online last June. That was our second one. And we're now up to, well, when I say early to, to produce power, we've just closed subscriptions on our fifth solar farm in Gardner. And that means we have four already up and running. And this fifth one is about to start producing power in the next month or two sometime. Uh, the actual startup date is often a little murky because we're depending on CMP to send a certain guy out to inspect the interconnection and give it his blessing and make sure that everything will work properly. And that we also have to give the list of subscribers to CMP in order to line them up to receive their solar credits properly. And all that takes a little jostling. So we're earlier than many of the subscription companies have been to producing power. Um, we are hiring Mainers as much as possible to do the outreach, like myself. I'm one of a team of three other people, well, three others, three total, two others besides myself, living and working in Maine for Power Market doing outreach. Um, the other two are primarily focused on um, answering the calls that come in from direct mail. And I'm out there trying to build these community partnerships, which of which you see about five of the little logos, which are um, referral partnerships, where we like to work with community organizations that will refer people to our projects as subscribers. And when they do, we make a donation to the organization as a thank you. So let me see, oops, next one. Yep, so that's it. As far as me, that's my contact information, but I'll put everything in the chat and I'm start sharing and pass the talking stick back to Mr. Glidden. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Kay. You guys are being great. You're being very disciplined. Um, so we now turn to Stephanie, um, who is with uh, Maine Green Power, Kay's former employer. Um, so we can hear all about that. And she's a senior program manager um, at Three Degrees, which is a company that's administering the Green Power Program on behalf of the Maine Public Utilities Commission. So I guess that's a contractor to the state, basically. So Stephanie, why don't you um, tell us what we need to know? Yes, thank you for that introduction. And I will share my screen here. Okay. Um, so I was asked to um, present to this group today about specifically RECs or Renewable Energy Certificates. And I'm going to get into that, but first a little bit of background. Um, uh, who is Three Degrees and, and who am I? So as, as Tim mentioned, I work for a company called Three Degrees. Three Degrees was selected by the Maine Public Utilities Commission through a competitive RFP process to market, administer, and supply the Maine Green Power Program. And that last portion about supply directly relates to renewable energy certificates or RECs, so I will get into that. Um, Three Degrees has been a certified B Corp for uh, 10 years, similar to Revision Energy. And we work with utilities across the country to help grow voluntary renewable electric and natural gas programs. Our utility partnerships mission on here on the slide is to empower utilities to offer their customers easy, accessible options to address climate impact. And we think Maine Green Power does just that. So um, getting into I wanted to start off by getting into a little bit about Maine Green Power, and then I will talk about RECs and how they relate to both Maine Green Power and Community Solar. So Maine Green Power is a program that's sponsored by the Maine Public Utilities Commission. And um, this program offers customers a simple, affordable way to support more local renewable energy. The program launched 10 years ago in 2012 and is available to both CMP and Versant Power residential or commercial customers. So like you've heard from the prior speakers, anybody who pays their own electric bill um, is eligible for this program, whether or not they own or rent their, their home. Um, customers can enroll online, and this is a screenshot of the homepage of our website. 
Um, they can enroll over the phone, through the email, or through uh, their CMP or Versant utility. And unlike Community Slower, um, customers who are participating in this program pay an extra surcharge on their bill, and it's shown as a line item on the CMP or Versant bill. Um, there's no commitment, and customers can cancel at any time. So a little bit about how the program works. Um, customers will continue to receive electricity um, through the, the grid as normal, um, and this program does not impact uh, us, their supply. But after signing up for Main Green Power, they'll receive an additional, or, or they'll see Main Green Power listed as an additional line item on their bill. And as I mentioned, it's, a, it's an additional charge. And what we do with that, those monies are um, purchase renewable energy certificates from Maine made renewable energy. So all of the resourcing from this program is from facilities in Maine. And then you can celebrate knowing that you are doing your part to help support renewable energy. Um, as a voluntary program, customers can choose to participate in any amount that works for their budget. Um, most customers choose to roughly match um, their usage and we, the program is divided into blocks. Um, so customers can sign up for however many blocks fits their needs. Most residential customers um, choose the, the one or the half block. Um, the, the average main home uses around 530 kilowatt hours per month. So that one block, should cover most of that. Um, but like I said, this is a voluntary program and there's no requirement that you exactly match your usage. And this map shows the facilities where the program has purchased RECs for um, in the past. And as you can see, there's a variety of different um, sources from solar, hydro, wind, biomass, some title in there. Um, the images that you see here are from the Rollins Wind Facility and the Fog, Fog Hill Solar Facility. So that's a little bit about Maine Green Power. Um, I wanted to dive in a li little more about RECs, Renewable Energy Certificates. And this is where we get a little technical. So um, please feel free to um, add any questions to the Q&A as we go, and I'll do my best to answer. So when renewable energy is created from sources like wind, solar, biomass, or hydro, there's actually two things that are created. One is the electricity that is added to the grid, and the other is the renewable energy certificate, known as a REC, R-E-C. Um, so if you're looking at this slide, follow the green and the blue dotted lines here, and you can see on the next slide that um, the electricity that's generated from a renewable resource gets added to the grid, and when it does, there's no way to tell the difference between electricity generated from a renewable source and an electricity generated from a non-renewable source, like a like a coal-fired power plant or a natural gas power plant. Um, in this in this graphic, they're designated by colors, but in reality, that that is not the case. Um, so the REC, the REC REC, is an important tracking mechanism to help ensure that renewable energy is actually generated and delivered to the grid, and also that no two customers are paying for the same unit of renewable energy generation. So in terms of definitions, um, a REC is, a, is proof that one megawatt hour of energy is delivered to the electricity grid. Okay, so what does that mean? Going a little bit deeper, RECs are a valuable commodity. They're bought and sold on an open market, which is analogous to a stock market. And this market is separate from the electric grid. So remember, the electricity is going to the grid. The RECs are sold, bought and sold on a, a, a separate market. And whoever owns the REC owns the rights to the environmental attributes of the renewable energy that is generated. So for example, avoided emissions, and, and those are valuable. 
when wrecks are retired, they cannot be sold again, and the environmental benefits of those wrecks can only be claimed by the person or entity that retires them. And wrecks are valuable to corporations with carbon reduction goals, to governments like the state of Maine with its renewable portfolio standard, or to private individuals who want to reduce their own climate impact. Why do wrecks matter in Maine? Um, I believe it was Kay who mentioned that Maine does have a renewable portfolio standard, which is a law that requires 80% of the energy generated to be renewable by 2030 and 100% by 2050. Those are great goals. Um, each year from now to 2030 has increased in goals. And for example, this year's goal in 2022 is for the, renew the renewable portfolio standard, sometimes known as an RPS, uh, is 48.8% renewable. So that's roughly half. Um, so customers who purchase the standard offer right now through CMP are currently receiving about half of their energy from renewable resources, which is awesome. We could all celebrate that. Um, but not all renewable energy is created equal. There are different classifications, um, and I've listed the classifications for this current year's um, RPS. Um, class two is older hydro facilities and in, excuse me, older renewable facilities. And in Maine, that is largely hydro. Class one is renewables that came online after September 1st, 2025, 2005. Um, and then class 1A is the newest generation. So anything that's come online within the last two years. And I know we're getting technical here, but I will bring it all together. Um, this chart shows the main rec prices over the last couple of years. The Orange, light orange line is class one and the blue client, the blue line is class two. And the reason why I explain what those different classifications are is because you can see here, there's been a significant price increase in class one rec prices starting in early 2021. Um, and because Maine Green Power is a rec based program, meaning the funds from the program go to purchase recs, um, this has had an impact on our program. However, even with these significant and unprecedented price increases, we have actually been able to keep the cost of Maine Green Power the same to customers over the last six years. And we um, will continue to do that for the next five. So um, we're proud that we are able to keep prices consistent. However, it does mean that we've needed to shift more resources of RECs to class two than previously. And um, most of the supply for the Maine Green Power Program is unfortunately no longer class one or 1A. We've essentially been priced out of this market because of um, the, the market forces of the increase in price for class one. Okay, so I've talked a lot so far about RECs, what they are, about the main RPS, REC pricing, and I, I hope this slide helps tie it all back to the reason why I think most of us are here, which is to learn about renewable energy options in Maine. Um, so here's a comparison of community solar and Maine green power. Um, on the left, we have an example. Uh, Jane is a subscriber to community solar. She supports renewable energy being added to the grid. She does not receive it directly to her home. Um, the developer or the owner of that solar facility will retain the RECs and can either keep them or sell them. Most in general, and, and again, this is, a, this is a broad generalization, but most um, RECs are sold to help finance the construction of the facility. More than half of the solar development in Maine since 2019 has registered to sell their RECs in states other than Maine. So the majority of the RECs from new solar facilities are being sold to other states. Theoretically, and, and this, is, this is not proven, but this is just a theory, theoretically, the RECs from Maine solar facilities could be sold to other neighboring states, Maine or New Hampshire, or excuse me, Massachusetts or New Hampshire, 
to help those states meet their RPS goals. And because those RICs are sold elsewhere, it makes it more difficult for Maine to meet its RPS goals because the price of the RECs are increasing. Um, switching over to the right side of the slide, John is a participant in Maine Green Power. And like Jane, he also supports renewable energy being added to the grid. He does not receive it directly to his home. He pays a little bit extra on his CMP bill, and those funds are used to purchase RECs from Maine located energy facilities. And every year the RECs are retired on his behalf and on the behalf of all the program participants. And he, because of that retirement of the RECs, he can claim the environmental benefits such as a reduced for carbon footprint. I think what's important to note here is that both community solar and mean green power, power are beneficial programs because they both support demand for and generation of renewable energy, just in different ways. Um, customers looking for the best of both worlds, meaning the, the potential bill savings from a community solar facility, but the environmental benefits from the rec retirements um, with Maine Green Power can actually sign up for both programs. And if there is, if there are significant cost savings from community solar, you could use a very small portion of those to pay the additional surcharge that Maine Green Power charges um, and receive, like I said, the best of both worlds of both programs. So I know that was a little bit more technical, but um, I also realized we've wrapped up the presentations today and I have um, my contact information here as well as the program manager of the program. But with that, I'll turn it back to Tim. Thanks, Stephanie. Appreciate it. Um, I think you did a pretty good job of trying to disentangle. I mean, it is a complicated um, system where there are multiple, there's clearly at least three different options floating around out there, maybe four. And, you know, the, and the motivations for choosing any one of those or any combination of those kind of really depends on the individual um, situation that somebody finds themselves in and what, what, what they're trying to accomplish. Um, so we sort of know one right answer for everybody. Um, we do have a string of questions, excuse me, in the Q&A. I don't think there's any in the chat, so we don't have to look at that. Um, these are, if I'd actually invite all the panelists just to look at those questions, maybe take them to the top there. They're pretty straightforward, but they are technical questions. Um, thank you, Ken, for these questions. The first two really have to do with, um, they're sort of a combined one, if you're trying to compare one solar farm to another. And I think, I think the implication there was these were, if you're trying, because there's so many subscription offers out there right now, if you're trying to compare between subscription offers, how do you distinguish between them? And if I've got that wrong, Ken put something in the email. But for those of you who've got some experience in subscription, which is several of you, um, anybody want to respond to that question? Sure, go ahead, Kay. There's one, this is Apollo the cat, by the way, my supervisor, he's helping. Um, the most important thing you want to ask any community solar um, company that's offering you a subscription is uh, where are your projects located and when will they come online? Because uh, largely the terms of subscription are going to be the same and they're all regulated under the net energy billing laws that um, the PUC has set up. So, yeah, I, um, I think that's the most important question. Like, where are your solar farms and, and how many of the, are there under development? Um, and when do you expect them to come online? And that's the answer you get, you have to always take with a grain of salt because every project seems to be sliding back in time, you know? And uh, so they all slide back together kind of, but if somebody tells you, well, our next solar farm that we know will come online is next February, and somebody else tells you September, well, you'll get your solar credits earlier if you are offered one in September. And so I assume part of what you were saying there, a little bit of that is track record as well. You might 
I mean, if, if the, the basic plan being offered in subscription is roughly the same between each of the offerings, then somebody who's done it 10 times and has, you know, nine projects already cranking away might have a little bit more experience. Is, is that a fair assessment? That's fair to say, yeah, some of the companies are doing the solar fields in lots of different states and uh, others in fewer number of states. Uh, some have been at it longer than others, yeah. but um, you can do your own research. <laughs> right. See right. who you like the best. Anything to add, Caitlin or Stephanie, on that one? No. Nope. Well, another question um, was... Can I add something? Yes, absolutely. Um, in the chat, oh, one thing is there is a comment about there's going to be so much information in the chat. This is being recorded and all the resources will go out to folks that have joined. Um, we've got your email. But also, um, I'm going to put in the chat and share out um, later is that the um, Topsom, Topsom's Energy Committee does have a um, basically a list of questions that we think you should be asking these solar companies uh, specifically about subscription solar. When is it coming online? A lot of these questions are right on our webpage, so I would um, ask folks to have a look at that. And if I could just also ask maybe a clarifying question that didn't come up in the chat just real quick. Um, the deal with the RECs, um, there was a generalization that um, subscription solar um, you know, people subscribing to them will not own, have the ownership. Or I'm, I, I particularly am interested in this because I see a lot of um, headlines coming out saying, "Oh, this town's gone green, this school's gone green," blah blah blah. But you got to be really specific if you're actually even allowed to say that you are green. You may really just be um, saving money, and that's all. So I wanted to find out if we could get a little clarification from from the panelists on that. I'd like to pick up, pick that one up. Stephanie, what happens to the RECs on a subscription plan? That is a great question. And, and maybe that's, um, maybe that's something Kaylin or Kay can answer. From, from our perspective, as far as we are aware, most of the solar development um, companies are retaining the RECs. And so the customers who are participating in a subscription solar farm um, are not entitled to claim the environmental benefits, um, but that might not be true for every farm and every facility. Um, so again, that, that was a generalization, but maybe um, my co-presenters can provide more color. The solar farms that we currently operate do sell RECs and the, the income generated by those rec sales is reinvested back into offsetting the operation and maintenance costs of those farms. Um, so it's kind of the, the money is held within the farm, but the recs are sold. Um, and that would potentially be a distinction between an ownership community solar farm through us and a rooftop solar system through us, where you could choose as the sole owner of that rooftop system whether you'd like to sell the RECs for that power generation or not. Um, whereas in the community solar farm, um, it's just sort of decided that, you know, to, for, for the economic benefit of the, the running of that farm and to keep costs in check, um, that the RECs are sold. Right. So to chase that a little further with something you said, Kaylin, if you're doing rooftop, you could use the, the person who's doing the investment would have the choice of holding onto the wreck themselves for whatever reason, or using it to basically pay down a piece of the upfront costs by rolling that somehow into the financing arrangement they have with the installers? Not into the financing, but it would be um, a regular check delivered to the homeowner by um, the, the broker or the, the company that's sort of managing those recs for them. We don't uh -huh. do that management ourselves for um, rooftop systems, but there are companies that we can set people up with to do that. Um, so they just get a direct payment from, from them. It's yep. not super lucrative, frankly, um, in Maine. Um, it gets a little better at larger scale, which is why it is generally included in large scale form farms. But um, on a rooftop system, you're talking, you know, in the low hundreds of dollars per year, probably. 
um, depending on how big the system is. So mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, uh, there were different types of recs referred to in, um, I think it was Stephanie's presentation and in other states, um, those can be more lucrative um, selling those depending on what the market is like. But it would be hard for like me sitting here in Thompson, Maine to be playing in the national market of recs. If I put a rooftop, I'd have to be using some kind of a brokering service to do. I mean, it'd, it'd get pretty complicated is what you're saying. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Anything to add? Um, just that we're, we'll say the same thing, you know, for the solar projects that Power Market is partnered with. I, I should back up one step to say Power Market is not the developer, builder, owner, operator of the solar fields that we're subscribing people for. We are partnered with different developers. The primary one we're working with is called Sunrays, S-U-N-R-A-I-S-E. Um, and uh, it's a not quite Maine company. It's a New, New Hampshire-based company with guys from Maine who started it, I believe. But um, when I asked that uh, direct question of what happens to the RECs uh, for these solar fields that we work with, I got a kind of vague answer, but it was kind of like, you pretty much should assume that they're being sold. <laughs> and our subscriber agreement does spell out that the subscribers do not get the environmental attributes of the RECs for the power that's generated. And just to pursue this one little step further, there are a couple more questions to get to, but beyond bragging rights, um, what is the relevance to an individual consumer of claiming the environmental benefits? I mean, bragging rights is not nothing, let me just quickly say, but what, what's the significance of that? Yeah, I'll, I'll start by answering. It, it depends on your own personal personal preference. And I think for residential customers, the, the bragging rights is probably the biggest benefit. Um, and, and maybe just the understanding that, um, that you're, what you're paying for or subscribing to is, is your tangible benefit. Um, for commercial customers and governments, it's a different story um, yep. because there are significant benefits to achieving um, climate change goals, net zero goals, the state RPS, um, stated goals that maybe um, investor-owned companies are responsible to their shareholders to meeting. So it's it's a bit of a different animal with it with um, commercial and, and government customers, but residential customers, I would say in general, you're, you're pretty right in just saying bragging rights and the, um, the comfort in knowing that you have those environmental benefits on your behalf. Well, as a grandparent with two young grandchildren, um, bragging rights is not nothing. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, Another question here is about secondary markets and ownership interests. And I think the question there is not about secondary markets and things like RECs, but actually if you buy in to, let's say, Caleb, one of your firms, investor, you know, actually ownership shares. Um, and is there a secondary market? Can, if I bought into one of your things, could I then sell my thing to somebody else? Um, I assume it yep. would come with obligations and expense, but you could. Yep, they're sellable, they're donatable. Um, you know, I often sort of refer to it as it's an asset that you own, like a boat. You know, it's not connected to your property, it's not part of your property, it's not part of your house. Um, it's a separate thing that you own, and you could sell it if you find a willing buyer. Um, we offer to sell shares on behalf of people if they'd like to have us handle that process. There's a fee for doing that, um, but you're welcome to just sort of sell it through your own networks or you know, list it online somewhere. There haven't really been that many that have changed hands um, within our farms yet. You know, I don't know, a handful or something like that over the years. Um, most people get into it and they, they want to get the full value out of it you know, over the life of the, of the lease term, which is 25 years plus some extension options beyond 25 years. Um, right. So, you know, if you're moving out of the state, obviously you wouldn't be able to benefit from generating, you know, credits 
in CMP's, you know, territory, if you live in North Carolina or something like that. So you might want to sell it in that case. Or um, I've had some people that, you know, downsize their homes and their electricity usage changes. Um, some of those people who had the foresight ahead of time bought two different shares, kind mm -hmm. of a, a big one and a small one, and they were able to just offload one of those and keep the other. Um, so there's lots of ways they can move around. But, um, you know, how much value they retain, I mean, that depends on, you know, the cost of building new solar farms at that time when you go to sell one. It depends on whether the federal tax credit is still around. Um, Presumably, you wouldn't get a tax credit if you bought a, a used. Yeah, just the original share gets the tax credit, not, right. not the subsequent buyers. So, yeah, I, you know, we would expect it probably would lose a little value because you've already claimed the tax credit and maybe the system's <clears throat> graded slightly over time and its output. So it's not making quite as much electricity as when it was brand new, but probably would retain most of it, um, again, depending on the market conditions at that time. But you wouldn't expect implicit in the question, I think, is also whether or not there might be some appreciation. I mean, is there a, more than just a speculative scenario where there might be appreciation in the spin shares or do you, are if, they if more like a capital farms are scarce, you know, I would think, you know, scarcity drives up price, right? So um, if, if there are no solar farms available to buy into 20 years from now or whenever this might be, um, maybe it would go up in value. Yeah, that's what right. you say. Or do you sort of go in the other way? So part of what you said there um, ha gets to the next question, which is about ownership interests. Um, if you... If you do buy into a farm, I mean, I assume if you buy something and it's on your house, it's part of your house, you own it on your house, it's part of your real estate. Tell me if I'm wrong. But if you buy a share in somebody's farm, that's something that's separate and distinct ownership. And the question here got a little bit into technical mm -hmm. elements there about, you know, liens and really sort of the exposure of that as an asset. Yeah, this may get a little, a little beyond my own personal expertise as well. And I can, we can certainly follow up um, offline and, and connect people to, um, to various folks here that, that might know a little more detail. But um, the way we've set things up currently is that when you buy a share of one of our solar farms, you're also joining an LLC, which owns um, the solar farm uh, or, or manages the solar farm. So you, um, you have that sort of layer of protection between you and the other um, members of that farm. LLC being limited liability um, corporation, right? Yep. And revision is not a part of that LLC. We're not a member of it or owner of it. We're not a member or owner of the solar farm. Um, we're just sort of the, the, the builder, the developer, and then later the hired manager. Um, so that we're the ones coordinating the lease payments and the insurance payments and, you know, the, the mowing of the grass and things like that. But um, we're, not a, we're, we're not an owner of that system in any way. We have a um, farmer uh, from a different Zoom session who um, rents out his uh, sheep and goats to do the mowing. So, you know, we can connect you guys a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, um, Stephanie, I see you <clears throat> You wanted to jump in with a, some uh, response to the whole question about auditing RECs and how that process is managed and, you know, the accounting of it is valid. Yes, and, and my knowledge on this is, is somewhat limited, but um, the question was who audit, audits the REC process and issues RECs to valid, validate them? Um, and there is an organization called the New England Power Pool Generation Information System, otherwise known as MePool GIS. And I am typing into the chat, the website for knee pool. Um, at least in the US, there's, there's usually a, a type of um, uh, geographically located um, body like, the, like knee pool who issues and tracks certificates for all of the megawatt hours of generation and load produced on the grid. And so for Maine, Maine is part of the New England power pool pool or power market. So MePool would be the um, body that issues and, and tracks RECs and, um, and when the RECs are retired, that retirement gets tracked on the MePool um, system as well. So beyond that, that's probably beyond my, my scope of knowledge. So if there's more information, um, 
I'm happy to, to dig into that a little bit more, but hopefully um, that helps answer the immediate question. Okay, thank you. Um, Kaylin, there's a question specifically for you that's more on the technical side, not the sort of legal economic side, but just really about, you know, here we are in Maine, we're, where were you, 44 latitude, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a little higher, um, sun's a little lower in the sky than if you were on the equator. How does that affect our solar capacity? Yeah, I was trying to find anybody, anybody should feel free to jump in this I was trying to find a slide here. here that I, I'm going to share, um, which I think gets to answering this question. Let's see. <clears throat> so if you can see that all right, um, this is basically a map of solar potential across the country, um, sort of like theoretical solar potential. Um, and you can just tell where the color bands are, where the higher production and lower production ones are relative to each other. So we're, we're not bad actually. Um, we're certainly not as productive as like, you know, Arizona or um, New Mexico or Southern California, but it's not like orders of magnitude difference. You know, um, these, these numbers here basically represent, you know, per one kilowatt of DC capacity that you have in a solar array, how many kilowatt hours of electricity over a year will that one kilowatt of system size produce? Um, because, you know, obviously the name of the game is time here. So, you know, 1600 or so is where we're at in Maine. Um, California is like 1800, 1900, 2000. So there's a difference, which obviously you would expect intuitively, um, but it's not like, you know, three or four or five times more power. Um, it, it's sort of a small, a small difference. So we, we're actually pretty lucky here in Maine. You know, people think, oh, it's a cold, snowy state. Um, we're pretty far north, you know, um, all of which is pretty much true, but we do have actually a lot of sunshine um, and we have a lot of cool, sunny, dry days, especially yeah. in the spring and the fall, which are great for solar production. Um, this is really a combination of both latitude and weather then, really. Yeah, yeah, weather yeah. matters a lot, certainly. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so we do pretty well. Um, you know, tree covers is certainly a challenge. Um, yeah. We're the most forested state. And so, you know, when I show up to a house that is ringed by tall pine trees um, and take some shade analysis and, and look at readings and things, um, sometimes it can, you know, it can be a, a challenge. Um, and that's where actually community solar farms really are a nice option to have because we can engineer and design that, you know, um, system to be, free of shade, you know, nearly all day long. Um, so you can kind of optimize your production. You know, they're, they're at the perfect pitch. They're at the right orientation. They're not right under a tree branch. So um, it, it really can be a benefit. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. So <clears throat> the, I pointed out to me that the um, members of the committee actually are pretty actively engaged at an individual level um, and have engaged with a bunch of different approaches, including some combos. And so I would invite um, Victor or Nick or um, Yvette, if you wanted to just briefly share sort of your own experience. Um, um, all right, Nick, you're still, you're still with us. <laughs> I'm still here. Yeah. Hang in there, Nick, go for it. <laughs> right. You're not off at the strategic planning um, meeting. Not quite, not quite. Right. Um, so maybe I should start. Sure. Uh, I've got a, a few different things going. Um, one, I've got a, a commercial building in Topsom that has about 160 kilowatts of uh, solar on top. <clears throat> and uh, not sure where we stand on being able to claim that we uh, uh, produce on that solar array uh, um, about 70% of the power that we consume um, at a, you know, it's a granite factory. And uh, we've also got a, a, a 54 panels on our uh, barn roof because I also have a farm. So we produce about two thirds of our power with that. And I am uh, have uh, for my home, um, I have an account with Power Market. Um, and, you know, that's going pretty well. It's, it's a, a little bit hard to understand sometimes, but I think I've, you know, come 
come to a pretty decent understanding. Uh, the first thing that happens uh, is that uh, we uh, subscribed in the summer and the summer is the highest production uh, of, uh, of the year, um, especially on a, on, a, you know, on a field array. So you get huge bills in the summer that are in excess of what you would uh, have gotten from CMP. And if you don't really play the uh, understanding of the banked credits, you can get kind of freaked out at first. Um, I had to talk uh, several people that uh, were looking at this down off the ledge. I said, no, no, it's going to be all right because it's not going to produce that much power in the summertime. I mean, in the wintertime, excuse me. Um, so what's happened in the wintertime, because we had a ton of banked credits in the summertime, is our wintertime bills have been tiny. Um, you know, way less than they would have been. So, you know, there's a little bit of a disconnect there that you have to use your imagination and take a good, uh, uh, you know, first take on what your power consumption is and decide what percentage of your power consumption you want to try to achieve. And typically going for 100% of your power consumption might be overdoing it. So you want to go a little bit less than that so that you don't have stranded uh, credits. Okay. <laughs> just add to that, that we kind of tend to automatically under allocate people uh, by right. default at about 90% of what their last 12 months of usage ha has shown to be in a research with CMP yeah. usage. Because of the very same reason, we don't want to see any of the subscribers get stuck with stranded credits. Right. So I guess what I'm saying is that when you get your bills in the summertime, don't freak out because, uh, you know, it's going to, you know, the, the curves kind of cross um, in, you know, ways that uh, require a little bit of faith. Do those bank, banked credits go stale at some point or do they age out? I think they expire after 12 months. Oh, yes. that correct. So you really don't want to strand them. Yeah, You yeah. don't want to overdo it. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that's think, Victor. You want to my spiel. Jump in. Uh, sure. I um, as with uh, Na um, Nick, I've um, I've got both installed solar on my house, and uh, and I'm also subscribed to Power Market. Um, and uh, we uh, when we put the solar on the house, we didn't have um, a, you know our heating was oil. Uh, we've switched since switched that to uh, geothermal and uh, we use a lot more electricity now. <laughs> of course, we use zero oil. Um, and um, so, yeah, we, we needed more power and more power than we could actually reasonably fit on the house. So um, this, the, the, you know, the, the, the uh, subscription model was seemed to be the best. Um, we, we looked at uh, revisions ownership model and um, it was a big chunk to bite off at the time. Um, and we thought, well, um, at any rate, uh, for a number of reasons, we decided to go with the subscription model. And, and so far it's been okay. We, we've only, our, our project has only started generating in December. So we don't have a, a full year's worth of bills yet. And we're, we're uh, um, you know, so, so we're actually kind of in a bad spot. We're paying for the, the winter <laughs> electricity usage. And now we're starting to pay for the summer elect electricity generation. <laughs> so I'm gonna be, you know, out a little more money this year at the beginning, but I'm hoping that next winter I'll not be paying any of these. I, I've, I've had electric bills that are, you know, close to five, well, I mean, not quite that much, but $400 or so, $500 a month. So, um, you know, just because of January and February, we're, <laughs> Uh, the heat pump's running a lot. <laughs> I mean, even even the geothermal, it's running a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. So and, and it uses a lot yeah. of power. So anyway. Good for me too. Yeah. Yvette, you wanted to talk a little about your experience with, or maybe research or experience with Maine Green Power. Yeah, full disclosure, I worked for Kay for Maine Green Power. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I, I got excited about that before I could even own solar. Um, so just my path is that I've been buying recs for, I bought them, um, I did a different thing called native energy, I think it's called, when I had my wedding, so I calculated how far everybody was traveling, all that kind of stuff, so to me, I'm totally, I want, I don't even need to tell everybody the kudos that I own my power, but when I drive my EV, I am powered by the sun. 
you know, to me, it is all about making a difference. And I feel like I put solar on my east facing side of my house. It's not optimal, but I wanted to be a, I wanted to demonstrate this in my neighborhood to show that it works. I have heat pumps. I've got the electric hot water tank. Um, I have the EV and I have, it was about 80% offset before I got the EV on the east side roof. Then I got a nut, so that's 29 panels. Then I got another 15 on my south facing roof because I knew I was gonna eventually get electric vehicle. And my job has changed um, since having the electric vehicle. And I know in the winter time, I do eventually lose all my bank credits come February. So I have a couple of um, two, $200, $250 months of, of bills, but otherwise it's completely prepaid. So to me, I like the idea that I'm prepaid, it's on my house, I'm not getting charged anything more than the 20 bucks or whatever it is CMP has to charge to be on the grid. But in addition for the extra amount, I'm not gonna do the accounting anymore. I buy 500 credits. I don't even think I need 500 credits. I got to make up for the 40 years I've been on the planet before I got my head checked. So I'm going to keep, so to me, I think there may be people on the line that, um, well, you know, one might not understand what a wreck is um, or maybe think they're getting wrecks. And I think that the, the price of this is really cheap. It's um, straight up on your bill. You can see it. Yes, you know, solar is my optimal um, source of power, but um, something that Stephanie didn't mention is that the hydro that you guys, or at least back when I was selling it, the hydro actually has to have like working fish ladders and stuff. So it's actually like upper echelon stuff. Um, so, and I'm, you know, it's main based renewable energy. And for me, that's, it's easier thing for me to do. It's right on my CMP bill, like I said, and I don't have any more rooftop to put it here. And I just didn't, I, just, for the accounting purposes, for me, I'm, that's why I, I do what I do. Well, I will say that's my neighbor. And when I wake up in the morning and take my dog out for a walk, I look at her solar panels and uh, she's a little higher on the hill. She gets good morning sun. So as long as the snow slides off, she's in good shape. And it is yeah, a little in your face. I'm sorry, but at least. Well, we got another. We got another guy down the street. We have another guy down the street who, who did an installation. Who was an electrician. Who did it all? It yes, he cool. came to my house and was like, "Let me see what you got." Yep. So <laughs> it catches. And I've actually got a scheduled uh, appointment with Kalen's folks to come out and look at my house. But I probably have some pine trees, Kalen, so I may may have a trouble there. Um, I missed earlier, Victor, that you we're interested in responding to the comparative benefits of one solar project over another. Was that something, did we cover that or did you have anything more you wanted to add? Uh, no, I think that was covered. Thank okay. you, yeah. Okay. Um, I thought I would share that. something that may be useful. I just worked up sort of a kind of back of the envelope comparison of um, a cash purchase of an ownership solar farm um, versus a financed purchase of a ownership solar farm and a cash purchase of a similar size rooftop system versus a financed purchase of a similar size rooftop system. So um, just, just so people can kind of put a little bit of um, a little bit of context to, to what some of those um, systems would look like in terms of pricing um, as we've talked about discounts that are um, you know locked in for subscription. Just at a, at a $200 a month bill, um, using current pricing, which is about 11,400 kilowatt hours a year, um, buying into an ownership community solar farm would be about $30,000 um, before the tax credit. Um, and there was a question in the chat about the timeline of the tax credit. It's currently 26%. Next year, it drops to 22%, and then to zero the year after that. And that's assuming it doesn't get renewed. Um, you know, who can predict what, what's going to happen in Washington? Um, that system financed um, would be currently kind of the, the finance product that we're using for those would be um, 20 years, starting at about 215 a month and then dropping to about 157 a month if you hand your tax credit savings over to um, the lender once you get it. So you'd be going from paying CMP about 200 to potentially dropping lower than that um, for a 20 year loan term. If you were to put a similar size system on your rooftop, 
there are lots of variables and factors that go into how big that needs to be and how expensive the installation is, how sunny your roof is, and so on and so forth. Um, probably on the low end, you'd be like around maybe $34,000 um, up front, and that would be if you have a really optimal roof. Very simple installation, lots of sunshine. You know, we could probably fit everything on one roof plane. Um, and it could potentially go quite a bit higher than that, even over 50,000 um, to make the same amount of power if you don't have a very sunny roof and we need to use lots of different roof planes and it's a long wire run and so forth. Um, that financed with um, kind of a typical product that we would use over 25 years could range from 175 a month to maybe 275 a month um, for 25 years. And those numbers would also assume that you'd be using your tax credit and paying the principal of the loan down. So you, um, you basically stretch it out over so you're kind a of, you're kind of financing the, the balance of the cost uh, net the tax credit. So again, potential um, on, a, on a great roof, definitely potential to lower your monthly bills and then lock that in um, over the time or potentially bump them up slightly to begin with. But as we all know, you know, electric rates tend to rise pretty regularly over time. So you'd, you'd eventually catch up um, and your finance payment would be probably less than what the going rate would be. Hopefully that's helpful just as a comparison and kind of putting some real numbers out there. Yeah, that is helpful. Anybody else on that general theme? I see in the chat that there's a comment about this being a good time of year to be investing in subscription in terms of hitting the right time of the the cycle of, of, of billing. Um, I'm assuming that's kind of an artifact of just the way the billing cycle operate, but good thing to know, it's a good time. Plant your gardens in the spring, so do your solar investments in the spring. Any other questions from folks? I'm trying to keep up here. I think there's no more Q&A questions that we've got in there. I will say with the heat pumps, I actually had, um, I had put off buying the heat pumps after I had the solar because I wanted to save some of my money to buy them in um, cash. And so the following year when I did put them in, I did have all those bank credits. So I, I understand what Nancy is saying in the chat. Um, it is nice to have those banked, but you'll also, as Nick mentioned, if you're doing a subscription solar farm, you need to realize that you're going to be, you know, paying for that up front. Super but high. it is nice to have that bill because <clears throat> that's when you're used to it being high. I, I will also say okay. from personal experience and um, that supply chain issues and getting backed up with plumbers and installers is a real issue too. So if you are thinking about these things, don't expect somebody to show up next week to do the installation. It's There's a long lead time on these things, so it's important to get onto it and get going. Um, I'm seeing some thank yous um, from here. We're also within a minute or two of our end time. And I guess I would just say, unless some more questions pop up, I would thank everybody, um, all 25 folks who are still hanging in there. We had, I think we were pushing 40 at one point. Thank you very, very much. And, and panelists, thank you for sharing some evening time um, uh, on a busy, a busy and wet, but a busy week. And thank you for all that. And, and my thanks to the committee too. The Thompson Committee is doing a great job. Um, and you know, this is a town that really has lots of good potential. So even if people move away to Hollowell, um, we'll let them come back. Yeah, not, not picking on anybody here. Um, but thank you all very, very much for this. And I wish everybody a great night. Um, anything else, committee members, that you want to say? Just final thank shout you, out? Tim. Thank you so much. And definitely thank you, panelists. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased that we had such a great showing. And I'm pretty sure that a lot of these folks didn't live in Dobson. So I, I'm excited to follow up with them with the resources. Super. Yes, thank you for the opportunity and thank you for, to the Energy Committee for inviting me. Thank Thanks you. everybody. Thanks. Have a good evening. Take care. <laughs>